Hi everyone, welcome to Here We Are, Brattleboro's community talk show. Today on our show, we have a whale biologist, and I know a lot of people in the audience uh, probably don't know what that is or what they do, but luckily we have Philip Hamilton here to tell us all about his job as a whale biologist. Welcome, Philip. Thank you, Wendy. Thank Good you to for be being here. here. It's great <laughs> to have you here. We were just talking before the camera started rolling, and um, Philip has unending stories about whales, and they are all so fascinating. And I'm sure everybody uh, has questions for him, but unfortunately, you're not in the studio, so you can't ask him. But we're going to try to get as much as we can out of him. Um, so, Philip, let's just start um, how you, what your your path was to get to whale biology. You yeah. came from Buffalo, yeah. New York. Grew okay. up in Buffalo, New York, and um, and uh, spend my summers in Canada um, every year. And so, it's actually interesting when I about. I don't know, 15 years ago, I've been a whale biologist for 30 years. About 15 years ago, I went back and I found my oldest journal. And it actually said in there, um, I always said, oh, it's kind of random I became a whale biologist. But my first thing I ever wrote in a journal was, I, all I know is I want to be near the water and work with animals. So oh, I guess. There you go. Kinda, and you didn't remember that. That's amazing. No, no. Wow. no. And did you follow it that you recall from that age? Um, so I always had a passion for wildlife and nature. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up in Canada, I'd, I was the local naturalist. Whenever mm -hmm. somebody needed like problem squirrels caught in a have a heart trap or, you know, something dead on the road identified, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it was always me. Yeah. Um, and I spend my, uh, my summers just walking through the woods um, and through the fields with our dog and I'd say, go find something and off we go on an adventure. So oh, that's so cool. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, yeah, I've always had an interest in nature and and um, and the marine environment. And then um, I actually went to University of New Hampshire for a year mm -hmm. and was studying oceanography there. And um, a friend of mine actually from high school said, you know, you can rack up a lot of debt because I was a New York State resident. Mm. Um, maybe you should consider going to state school and then you could, you know, study oceanography as as a master's program yeah. or something. Yeah. And, um, that seemed to make pretty good sense, so I did that. And um, they didn't have any oceanography pr program. It was at um, SUNY Binghamton, mm -hmm. State University of New York at Binghamton. And um, but I studied uh, lots of other sciences and you know plants and funguses and birds. And um, and then after I got out, um, and I was able to put myself through school, waiting tables and. Yeah, we were saying yeah, tuition six hundred dollars a semester. Wow, <laughs> which I just can feel the people in the audience who are going to school <laughs> yeah, now, I like, know. cringing. But yeah. anyways, so, um, and there was a job opening uh, at the Center for Coastal Studies out in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And having never seen a whale, I, you know, wrote an impassioned letter, and then I uh, drove from Binghamton out to Provincetown. Um, they had said, you know, don't stop in, just letters. And so I went and stopped in, because <laughs> I kind of knew that, you know, without them seeing my personality, there wasn't, yeah. you know, any chance. Yeah, yeah. So I got that job. And the thing that I reflect on is that, um, you know, it was a very low paying job, but the fact that you could get a job as a paid job as a whale biologist was remarkable yes. back then. Yes. Um, it was almost all volunteer work, and most people worked their ways up through yeah. many years of volunteering. Uh -huh. Um, and it was a brand new field, really. I mean, they just started studying whales in the beginning of the 1980s. So, oh my gosh, this, really? That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. So this is 1986, and it's oh, you know, it's brand new. This, yeah. The people I worked with were social workers and fishermen, and um, so yeah. The thing that's interesting is I would not have been able to afford to have that job if I had gotten trained for it at the University of New Hampshire. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, education opens doors and debt can close doors. Yeah, so. that's true. At that time, what was your job like? Because I know it, it's changed over the years. Basically. Yeah, it, ha it has changed. Um, the scope of what I do has changed. Some of the, the real core basics actually hasn't changed too mm. much. Um, so back then, um, I was looking at black and white photographs of, I studied North Atlantic right whales. Mm -hmm. um, there are only about 450 left um, in the ocean. And um, the basis of what we do is we identify individuals and track them, and we identify them based on photographs of markings on their heads. 
And so back then, it was um, taking photographs in the field. We developed them. We, you know, we had to develop our own film and stuff in the basement of our research facility. Mm -hmm. And, and um, it was the thing that was great about starting at the Center for Coast Studies is we had a pretty small number of right whales that had been seen the summer before I started in mm -hmm. 1986, but that we had about 1,500 sightings of mm -hmm. 30 whales, so over and over and over again. So I really got to train my eye on all the subtle ways that the same whale can look different but mm -hmm. actually be the same. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, I think, was part of the reason I got really good at identifying whales. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are two things I want to go back to. One is if you can tell uh, the audience what right whales are, because I never knew this, and it's R-I-G-H-T. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, sadly, they got their name, the right whale, because they were the right whale to hunt back mm -hmm. um, as early as like the 11th century. Um, they were the right whale to hunt because people are killing them in rowboats. They were rowing out to, and having to row them back to shore. So they had to be coastal. Mm. Right whales stay fairly close to mm -hmm. the coast. Mm -hmm. um, they float when they're killed, which not all whales do. Mm -hmm. So you could tow them to shore. And they were really lucrative. They have um, really thick layer of blubber. Mm -hmm. So that was rendered into a lot of oil. Mm -hmm. And um, they don't have teeth. They have baleen to filter mm -hmm. out plankton. And the baleen is quite long in right whales. So mm -hmm. that was very lucrative. It yeah. was used um, much the way plastics are used today. Yes, right. Make combs and buggy whips and things like that. Unbelievable. The other thing that kind of blew my mind is the fact that you are identifying these individual whales. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, I think it can be hard to understand how important and cool that is that we can identify yes. individuals. So um, a lot of what we do, I, I say, is sort of like we're, we're putting together pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Hmm. So every sighting of a whale, we get photographs of, hopefully, we figure out who it is. So then we know, oh, this is Stumpy. And she's been seen, you know, 500 times. She was last seen with a calf down off of Florida. You know, now she's up here in Cape Cod Bay. Um, you get to, um, they're like little pinpoints into a whale's life. Yeah. We, we, it's, you, you can't study them while you study most things because you're really only getting glimpses. Yeah. You have to be in the right place at the right time, mm -hmm. good weather, good visibility. Um, they're not at the surface all the time. So you're really just getting little snapshots. So yeah. yeah, I mean, we can, knowing that, so for example, um, we have about 720 whales cataloged, but we only think about 450 are still alive. Mm -hmm. And each year we get, you know, four or 5,000 photogra photograph sightings, mm -hmm. many thousands of photographs, but different sightings from all over the Eastern North Atlantic, mm -hmm. from people down off of Florida and Georgia where the right whales give birth and mm -hmm. up in Canada and off of uh, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And, um, it is very, very rare that we see a whale that we haven't seen before. Hmm. So that's basically the discovery curve of the population. It makes you think we actually do have most of the population photographically and now genetically captured as well. And so, yeah. but it's only by knowing who the individuals are that we're able to know yes, that. When, when we're in the right place, we know that they're there. Yes, right. There, there are gaps, and for some whales, there are huge gaps. And mm -hmm. it's really interesting. There's some whales who, you know, they're sort of coastal whales. We see, we'll see them in mm -hmm. Florida, and then we'll ne next see them a couple months later mm -hmm. in Cape Cod Bay. Mm -hmm. Do they migrate? Yeah, but they don't. Um, migration is uh, simply thought of as, you know, they go north and south, you know, south during the winter, north during the summer. They really and, do. <laughs> yeah. Um, they move so much. It's extraordinary. We, we had one whale that... Um, was seen, I think it was first seen in Florida um, in January. Two weeks later, it was photographed in Cape Cod Bay. So two weeks to go from wow. Florida to Cape Cod Bay. Oh, that's moving. Yep, two weeks later, it was down back in Florida. Three weeks later, it was back up in Cape Cod Bay. So it was going back and forth, you know, huh. thousands of miles. Um, and when they're down south, they're not feeding. So it's, it was really interesting to think, well, what's motivating yes. this whale? who then were like, well, what is this whale? It was a 10-year-old male, so not quite sexually mature, just on the verge uh, of it. Uh -huh. um, they're not feeding down mm -hmm. in the south, so I think there was something social that was, Yeah, Yeah, sounds you know, like there's something social going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, so you've been doing this for 32 years, and I would imagine not only has the whole field changed, but the way of cataloging these whales, certainly at some point you must have gone digital. You were doing slides, yeah. right, for yeah. years. Yeah. 
So yeah, that's actually a good segue into how we you know, ended up in the Putney area. Mm -hmm. um, so I work for the New England Aquarium, which is based in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, and so for many years I was there. And, um, uh, and yeah, you had to be on site in order to identify whales because we had a catalog of slides that are this sort of type photographs of a whale. Mm -hmm. So when you get new slides in, you'd go and you compare it to this catalog. And um, leaning over a hot light table with a jeweler's loop. And, um, and then um, in uh, 2003, we really started to go pretty much full, to, full on digital. And it was a whole new kettle of fish. So I got uh, a grant from the National Science Foundation to develop this whole new software and database system. Coincidentally, it allowed me to live remotely oh, and still right. you know, work remotely. Right, and yeah. during those, so this was, you'd been in the field already for 15 years or so? Yeah. yeah. And, and so, but you were working with a very tight group of people, is that correct, when yeah. you would go out into the field, so to speak? Yeah. Um, or working even in offices? In, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's really, it's one of the things that's been um, really compelling for me working with this species is and the people who are drawn to it just mm -hmm. have a lot of passion, a lot of heart. Mm -hmm. It's a really um, compelling story, you know, this small population that we pretty, pretty much know all of them. And we know a lot about them, but there's still huge holes. Mm -hmm. So there's that mystery, that combination of knowledge and mystery. Right. And the passion, it's, um, you know, we're working in mostly, especially in the beginning, in a small office with tons of people in there. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, everybody else's business. And, and during the field work, which, you know, early on, it was six to eight months for me that I was in the field. Mm -hmm. Now it's more like, you know, one to two months. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you're, you're living, you know, cheek by jowl. You know what people are like at four in the morning or yes. late at night after they've been seasick all day. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a family. Yeah, um, it's a real community. Yeah. 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 One of the only things of certainty that I ever have experienced in my life is I, I remember being, um, I was taking care of a friend's garlic farm in central Maine. <laughs> it was in the winter. <laughs> And I walked out onto this hillside, and things were blowing, and it was just that stillness of winter. Mm -hmm. And I could just feel like my soul, like, mm. ah. Mm. And right then and there, it was like, I belong in the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was so certain that it didn't matter that I could see no path to doing that and still be employed. Yeah. You know, I was just mm -hmm. like, at some point, that'll happen. Mm -hmm. And then when I met um, Tim, uh -huh. my husband now, um, we both wanted to go rural, and and um, and so it's sort of the passion took us here. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, we got up here in 2001, and then um, yeah, I wasn't sure what my other career would be. Mm -hmm. I was still working part time doing the whale stuff, and we, to both Tim and I, were going back and forth from Boston to here. And I had a friend who was um, uh, getting his PhD at UVM, looking at. Um, among other things, carnivore distribution in relationship to roads. Hmm. And um, he was really curious to see, uh, initially the question was, and ended up uh, um, evolving, but whether or not carnivores that were closer to roads were more stressed out. Hmm. Um, and so he put together three teams of researchers to use scat sniffing dogs mm -hmm. to wander all over Vermont mm -hmm. looking for the scat of um, black bear, bobcat, and fisher. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was one of the teams, I was the dog handler. Um, so this dog got flown across the country, had been trained by um, a police officer um, in Washington state uh -huh. um, to find scat. And so we worked with um, three teams with three dogs. Uh -huh. And uh, it was really it's pretty extraordinary. And it was a way to you know, get to know Vermont in a way that yes. I never would have. <laughs> yeah, you never would have. You yeah, I found, I found out where the timber rattlers are were, which oh. we, Bob and I, are, my dog, um, found timber rattlers yeah. over by Lake Balmazine. Uh -huh. That was exciting. So you you'd had a dog who was trained to track whale scat. Yes. Bob came into our lives because... Um, and he, Bob is a dog, folks. Yes, Bob yes. is a dog. <laughs> yeah, and it was very funny for people because we put um, on our answering machine you've reached Philip, Tim, and Bob, yeah. and everyone was like, hmm, oh. what's, what kinky things going on there? Um, yes, Bob the dog. Uh -huh. um, he, uh, he was found as a stray in Washington State and uh -huh. really disease-ridden and thin. And hmm. um, This woman who trains dogs to find narcotics and, and bombs and things like that, um, 
she periodically goes to the pounds and looks for dogs, mm -hmm. and she only uses play as a training tool. She mm -hmm. doesn't use food. Mm -hmm. um, and so she goes into the pounds and she bounces tennis balls and watches to see how the dogs will respond. Uh -huh. And uh, Bob, you know, he loved his tennis balls. Uh -huh. So anyways, he, uh, he got trained actually first for narcotics work, uh -huh. um, but he didn't like to um, jump up onto tabletops and slippery surfaces. So, um, so he got demoted or promoted uh -huh. to, to scat work. Uh -huh. um, and so a lot of your research with, um, with tracking whales has to do with, with getting scat, right? A lot of the it's information. A it's a component, yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, there are things that we can learn from scat that we can't learn mm -hmm. any other way. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been collecting it opportunistically for years. And you, know, you could look to see what they've been eating and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the late 90s, they had a real um, drop in reproduction, mm -hmm. and just a single calf was born in 2000. Wow. And so people were really curious whether or not they weren't able to get pregnant, mm -hmm. or they were getting pregnant and weren't able to carry the fetus mm -hmm. to term. Mm -hmm. And the only way to answer that question was to know if they had been pregnant. Mm -hmm. pregnant. And the only way to do that was looking at hormone analysis mm -hmm. in, in the poop. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot more you can get from that. It's really, it's, it's really fascinating. You can um, get diseases they've been exposed to and whether or not they have chronic stress mm -hmm. or long-term long -term stress. Mm -hmm. It's really, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. A lot of your work also has to do with disentangling whales. Yep. Yep. And I think this is something that folks don't, probably don't know much about. Yeah, I, I don't often do the disentangling myself, um, but it's um, right whales as they swim um, either at the surface or they can swim, you know, 800 feet um, searching for mm -hmm. food, and f often food is at that depth. Mm -hmm. um, they encounter the lines, um, fishing lines that are mostly what they get entangled in are mm -hmm. the lines that are marking where gear is. So mm -hmm. a line that goes from a buoy down to a lobster trap or mm -hmm. a crab trap or a gill net. Um, and um, they're very strong animals, so they can mostly break the lines, but sometimes they, they spin, they get them wrapped around their flippers, and the entanglements can last for years, oh. um, and they're really, they're, they're really heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there are um, a few really skilled um, teams that have developed a technique. It was started at the Center for Coastal Studies, um, where you go out and you, um, you work on a way to tend to try to slow it down by attaching uh, a boat or buoys to the, the gear that the whale's mm -hmm. wrapped in. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, with really long poles, try to cut systematically mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. So the whole, mm -hmm. whole thing comes off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's difficult. You have to be in the right place at the right times. Mm -hmm. You know, often a whale will be seen entangled, you know, far offshore. And by the time, you know, a disentangling team can get out there, um, you know, they can't relocate the animal. So yeah. um, it's, it is great that we have that as a tool, yeah. but really what we're all aiming for is a way to not have them get entangled exactly. in the first place. Right. Right. More than 85% of the population has been entangled <sighs> at least once, and some of them, you know, seven times. Oh my gosh, so, yeah. yeah, and so there's a lot of stress in relation to that too, and yeah. so therefore that affects the population, yeah. right? Yeah, it affects their ability to reproduce. Yes, yeah. right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. And, um, and you had a rough year. Last year? I did, and not just me, but um, so last year we had an unprecedented amount of mortality in the right whale um, field. Mm -hmm. There were 17 right whales died. Mm -hmm. um, many of them died from ship strikes or entanglements in fishing gear. Um, others we couldn't determine. Um, either the carcass wasn't retrieved or mm -hmm. it was so decomposed, we mm -hmm. don't know. Um, but so far, pretty much all the large whales that, large right whales that have, been, have died it's always been human caused. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we also had a lot of uh, entanglements, which are heartbreaking, and we were able to disentangle um, two of them, um, our team up in the Gulf St. Lawrence, but doing the second one, um, our captain was killed by the tail. Oh. And um, it was, uh, <laughs> I, it was a dramatic, traumatic moment mm -hmm. and it really rippled actually worldwide mm -hmm. it was amazing mm -hmm. i don't think i mentioned this to you but um it was like i think maybe sarah silverman nominated um joe the captain for um to to be sainted or I've, there's yeah. some i mean it, it was there was a lot yeah. of 
energy and interest mm -hmm. in that. And because there, there are also people who do disentanglements all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and this was the first time that this had happened. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's painful. And then as far as the whales go, we also had, um, this year we have had no b births. And that's the first time in 38 years, oh. which is since we've been ca sort of cataloging them regularly. Oh, that's kind of a big deal. It's a really big deal. Yeah. Um, and it's a big deal when, in addition to um, all the deaths last year. All the other things, yes. And they're also shifting where they feed. We're mm -hmm. not seeing them um, in some of the historic, mm -hmm. um, recently historic feeding mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. um, and all that combined, you know, and, and for different people, different parts weigh more, but it's just, it's, we, um, we have a, a lot of heart, you know, in this work, yeah. in the species, mm -hmm. and um, I think all of our hearts are hurting. Oh, yeah, I can know. imagine, because it, it's not just like tracking whales, you know these whales, right. you recognize them, right. they're, they're familiar to you. How have you found a balance to all of this? Well, I mean, that's one thing that definitely moving to Vermont has been good um, because I, I have much, uh, uh, a larger portion of my life is outside of work. Mm -hmm. um, when I was first in this field, I often lived with the people I worked with. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah. you know, we, we lived and breathed it. Mm -hmm. And if I were living in that situation now, given the condition of right whales, you know, the population is going down fairly mm -hmm. quickly mm -hmm. right now. Um, I don't think I could handle it, honestly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I've got, you know, a rich community. I've got a good home life. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got other interests, you know, singing with rock voices yes. and yes. doing some vernal pool monitoring on uh -huh. the side. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, so um, it really helps to go and, you know, work in the garden yes. and, um, you know, listen to the Orioles and yeah. Um, yeah. And I also, I mean, you know, I've, I've realized I have to practice hope. It's, mm -hmm. it's actually a decision um, in order to continue doing my work. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I do have some hope that things are so severe, the situation is so critical for yes. right whales right now, uh -huh. that um, there's a chance that maybe after years and years and years of an entanglement problem, mm -hmm maybe something effective will get done. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but. Well, it's nice that you cultivate that because I'm sure that it's helpful in all ways, mm -hmm. not only to keep your own sanity, but, um, but to keep it, <clears throat> keep it all going. Yeah. Um, and so you're pretty much working alone now. Is that right? Yeah. 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 How is that? It's, um, it's challenging. Yeah. You know, when I first started, so I ran a little office space in the village of Putney. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I go and sit in front of a computer all day by myself. <laughs> and initially, you know, it's peaceful. I'm pretty focused, so it's not a problem of not staying motivated or whatever. Yeah. But um, the thing that I've realized is one of the things that has held me to this work is it's such a great group of people I work with. Mm -hmm. And when I worked in an office with them, you know, we we talk both personal stories. We'd mm -hmm. also talk about work. There'd just sort of be, you'd have this sense that you were part of a collective team working together mm -hmm. towards something, mm -hmm. which I get when I go back into the field. You know, that comes back like yes, that. Yes, right. But it gets eroded when I'm just alone mm -hmm. day after day in front of a computer. And mm -hmm. I have, you know, lots of email contact and, mm -hmm. and stuff. But, um, but yeah, it's a really interesting... Um, I don't know how you can actually keep that feeling of human community yeah. when you're working remotely. Yes. We've got all the tools, yeah. that, you know, yeah. but it's not the same. Yeah. That's <laughs> and I don't right. think it ever That's will right. be. And for you, it sounds like you've found uh, ways to have that human interaction, but in other things, yeah. not in your work, yeah. which in some ways I suppose makes sense, but for the work itself. Also the fact that um, the work that you've done has not been around that long. You know, yeah. it's only been what thirty, well, yeah. yeah, thirty some odd years. Yeah. Yeah. And so to go through that kind of an arc is pretty dramatic, it as is. well as the arc of the whales yeah. during that time, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's really something. Yeah, and the arc of the whales just—I I don't think I shared this with you, but has been—it's a—it's not a straight line. Mm -hmm. You know, the '90s, the end of the '90s, the population was going down. Mm -hmm. 2000s was great. Um, we actually had a lot of calves born, and mm. the population was gr growing better. Their skin looked healthier, mm -hmm. and then 
uh, starting in 2010, 2011. They weren't finding food where they usually did, and yeah. everything sort of started to tank again. Yeah. So that having seen that arc, yeah. um, that also gives me some hope. If we can just stop killing them, yes. they can sort of um, weather these yeah. changes. And you know, like the, in the late 90s, it was probably a food and maybe a disease thing that went through the yeah. population. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly, mm -hmm. but you know, they weathered it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, and you also you also give a lot of talks, don't you? You also go out into the public and talk about whales yeah, and what you do. A fair amount, you yeah. know. I, I do scientific conferences and then mm -hmm. um, a handful of you know school groups mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. And I would think just by the very nature itself of of what you do in the whales and your connection to the whales, and I think so many of us feel the same way, you know, as this beneficent force, you yeah. know, that's on the planet. Yeah. I would think that. Um, talking to a group of people, you would bring a lot of heart into what you're doing and sharing that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, um, I do think that's really important. I, I'm more, I feel my heart more, even like right now, mm -hmm. um, than I did probably, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's partially my own spiritual um, journey and sort of development. And it's also, um, as far as talks, it's, it's having the confidence I think I shared with you that a lot of scientists feel like frauds. Mm, yeah, um, it's so interesting. Yeah, and and you be. I mean, I'm like people are tops in my field. They're like nervous for every talk. Uh -huh. They they feel like they're going to be found as you know imposters. It's 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 just a. I think it's something about public speaking in general that can yes, that foster could be. that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, but because of that, for myself, I found like I had to be, you know, I wouldn't say anything that couldn't be substantiated mm -hmm. by the facts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was trying to, you know, have my outer, outer uh, f facade be really rigid. And, mm -hmm. and now it's like that doesn't matter so much. One, I feel like I know what I know pretty well. Yeah. I've been doing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. But two, it doesn't, that doesn't, there's no opening for people to really see how it impacts me. And it's yes. not... It's not just science. And people have such a, um, a misconception of what science is. Yeah. You know, one of my big things I like to talk about is people think science is about answers, and it's not at all about <laughs> answers. It's just about questions. Yeah. And it's, it's, to me, it's, it's the same thing as like, um, someone who's adamantly like, has a belief system that can't be mm -hmm. questioned. There's no room for discussion or exploration, whereas if it's, if it's an idea or a question, mm -hmm. there's huge open. So mm -hmm. every, every question we have, we ask it scientifically, we might get a little bit more information, and that just informs the next question. Right, right, yeah. that's and it's a, really exciting. That's very exciting, and yeah. I'm sure that it's probably the most exciting part of what you do, oh, really. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I was uh, probably 15 years in, I felt like, we have this population wired. We really know what's going on. You know, it's, I just felt really cocky. Uh -huh. And since then, I've seen as, you know, some of my knowledge has been disproven because there, there are patterns that happen with right whales that are, you know, 20, 30 years mm -hmm. long. Mm -hmm. um, right. And so, you know, that, that cockiness has been pr appropriately eroded. Mm -hmm. And now I feel very humble. Mm. Um, but that's so much more exciting to be like, wow, yeah. we do know these things, yes. but the rest is just a beautiful mystery, you know? Oh, that's, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's a great place to stop. <laughs> what do we have to do? Yeah, it's wonderful to look at it that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah cause that will, that will keep you engaged and, yeah. and also to enlighten the whole field. Yeah. Thank you, Philip. You're welcome. Thanks to all of you for joining us again for Here We Are. We will be back next week, and we will see you then. Yeah.